Okay. All right. Well, um, I'm going to talk about something fairly different from the last talk. Um, but thank you to the organizers for um, inviting me. Um, this is my my first systems workshop um, coming from the ice sheet modeling community. Um, and uh, where I'm going to start today is actually in not too different a place. Um, so starting with water on the landscape and, and what it means for communities. Um, I am Alex Robel. I'm a assistant professor uh, at Georgia Tech um, School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. And today I'm going to be talking about um, a stochastic ice sheet model uh, that we've been developing in my group with some collaborators. Um, and at the end, I'll briefly talk about some hydrology modeling that's in progress as well. All right, so this is sort of the you know, ultimate motivation for this work. Um, so this is uh, in my home state of Georgia. Um, uh, this is Highway 80, which connects the city of Savannah to Tybee Island. Um, it's the main inhabited barrier island on the coast of Georgia. Um, has um, about 5,000 permanent residents, including a large seasonal population. Um, and this is not during a hurricane. Um, this is not during like a particularly large storm. Uh, this is high tide um, in 2015 during a king tide. Um, and so during this king tide, um, I'll just let this drone run back a little bit. During this king tide, Highway 80 flooded, and this is the only uh, overland connection uh, between Tybee Island and the city of Savannah, where most medical services, emergency services are located um, for Chatham County, uh, where Tybee Island is located, right? And so ultimately, you know, the story here, which is sort of the, the motivation for my talk today, um, is that when Highway 80 was extended to Tybee Island in the 1930s, um, sea level here um, was about a foot lower uh, than it is today, right? So it made sense to build the highway at the elevation that it was built. Um, and um, as sea level has been rising globally, um, but in particular on the East Coast of the United States um, at something like 50% higher than the global mean rate, um, you know, this has become these engineering decisions that were made over a century ago um, have become problems. Um, and so ultimately the context here um, is, you know, uh, ice sheets are melting, um, and this is contributing to global sea level rise. Um, glaciers um, in mountainous regions are also melting, um, and seawater is expanding um, due to ocean warming. Right. So all of these different processes, uh, which you can see here on the left, so this is uh, sort of the our community consensus projection of sea level rise over the next few centuries um, from the recent IPCC SROC report. Um, and so you can see sort of the combined sea level projection um, on the bottom um, in the big figure um, under a high emission scenario in red and under a low emission scenario in blue. Um, and then you can see the contributions from the loss of mountain glaciers, the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet. And there are two things that I really wanna point out here um, is that 2100 is sort of a special time um, in our sea level projections, not only because it's a nice round base 10 number that we usually project to, um, but also for sea level projections, it tends to be when emission scenarios diverge, that is to say, when the fruits of our current actions start to become most apparent, um, and when uncertainty really starts to grow quickly, right? And so as you're going forward into the future, what you see is that the uncertainty, and this is our current community consensus of uncertainty, is by no means a complete accounting of uncertainty, and that's partly what I'm gonna be talking about today, is accounting for the complete uncertainty and sea level projections. Um, but the magnitude of uncertainty, right, so the spread of these bars is approximately equal to the signal of uncertainty, right, they're of the same order of magnitude, right? We know that it, sea level is going to be rising globally on average, varies a lot regionally, um, but the amount by which it will be rising um, is really where there's a lot of uncertainty going into the future. And so why is there so much uncertainty? Well, there's a variety of reasons which ultimately come back to um, many things within sort of the field of glaciology and ice sheet modeling um, that we still don't understand. Just to go back here for a second, the last thing I wanna point out is that most of this uncertainty in the projections, especially after you get past 2100, is coming from your ice sheet projection. So the Greenland ice sheet mass loss and Antarctic ice sheet mass loss that you see here on the left, right? So ultimately, post-2100 sea level projections are so uncertain due to lack of understanding of various processes in our ice sheet systems. Uh, one is how the climate forces the ice sheet system, but also how 
uh, the climate responds to changes in ice sheets. So here's an example on the left of uh, from a recent ice sheet model intercomparison project, ISMIP, um, which is a part of the sort of CMIP model intercomparison project for climate models. And you can just see the uh, each color, you don't really need to, to look at the, the fine details here. Each color is a different climate model that is used to force ice sheet models. Right, and so the top is surface mass balance. That is basically the net balance of how much snow is being added on the surface of ice sheets. And at the bottom is basal melt, where the ocean comes into contact uh, with, in this case, the Antarctic ice sheet. Right, so there's a really wide range, basically, in how ice sheet projections are seeing the climate. Um, also, within ice sheet projections, within ice sheet models. Um, there are many under-resolved multi-scale processes. So uh, an example on the top is sort of the, this is a few meters of interface. This is from a uh, direct numerical simulation of the boundary layer beneath an ice shelf where it comes into contact with the ocean, right? And so you basically have, you have a dissolving boundary, right? That is compositionally different from the ocean that it's in contact with. Um, and then you have complex currents uh, flowing across it. Um, and so calculating the heat and salinity flux through this boundary layer is an incredibly difficult problem. Um, and observations tend to indicate that the current parameterizations that we use can be wrong by up to an order of magnitude. Um, and the bottom is an example of a very high uh, fidelity model of iceberg calving um, at the edge of an ice sheet. Um, and this is something that's also not resolved in our ice sheet models that we're using for projections. And then finally, of course, issue in a lot of geosciences, um, but particularly a problem in glaciology is data sparsity. We really don't have very much data before we start, we turned on satellites, right, in the, in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, and this is in particular a problem because ice sheets respond to climate change on time scales of at least decades, but really more like centuries, right? And so we've only been observing a small snapshot of time. We've only been observing ice sheets during a small snapshot of time during which they've been changing. And this is a problem um, because then we have a problem calibrating our models to observe this or to reproduce the sort of observed ice sheet sensitivity to climate change. So all of these contribute to, to producing this uncertainty. Um, but in particular, what I wanna talk about here in just a just short few slide vignette is that there is an intrinsic problem of growth, growing uncertainty in ice sheet projections. And ultimately it comes down to the fact that um, the Antarctic ice sheet and parts of the Greenland ice sheet are susceptible to something called the marine ice sheet instability. If you haven't heard of the marine ice sheet instability before, it in sort of summary comes from the fact that large parts of our large ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, are resting below sea level. So what this is, is a map of the elevation if you took all the ice off of Antarctica, right? And so people who haven't seen this before are often surprised because Antarctica is actually an archipelago, um, at least at its, its current elevation. Um, and the ice sheet sort of combines all of these islands together um, to what we see on the surface, right? But the issue here is that basically in the blue areas are areas that are below modern sea level. And as the ice sheet retreats, the ice sheet remains in contact with the ocean. And in particular, the speed of ice flow speeds up as ice um, retreats into deeper and deeper water, right? So an example here is on the left area of Antarctica that we call West Antarctica. You can see there's this area where um, the base of the ice sheet goes from being maybe 500 meters below sea level um, to something like close to two kilometers below sea level. And so as uh, ice sheet models project the ice sheet retreat into that deeper and deeper water, the ice flow speeds up and you have an accelerating and irreversible retreat. And so when models simulate this, the issue is that this instability leads to sort of an intrinsic growth and uncertainty. And this is something that's known from dynamical systems theory. We had a paper a few years ago in PNAS using some methods from st statistical physics to show um, in sort of a mathematical model and then in a, in a more complete model, the fact that any ice sheet model that simulates this instability, this marine ice sheet instability, if you have many ensemble members, so here's just a sort of a toy schematic example on the right. Um, if you have many ensemble members, either that have parameter uncertainty or that have uncertainty in the climate forcing, there is intrinsically going to be a growth in the uncertainty and a skewing in the distribution of uncertainty towards worst case scenarios, right? And this skewing ultimately comes from sort of the nature of nonlinearities and ice sheet dynamics that I won't get into in here. But the point is that when we look 
at ice sheet model projections. So here's just two more examples. But the one that I showed before was sort of an aggregation of many different projections. But here's two um, sort of well-cited projections for Antarctic ice sheet evolution and contribution to sea level rise over the next few centuries. And you can see the same growth and uncertainty and also skewing towards higher sea level contribution. And ultimately, this is a problem because if you want to build something on the coast, right, and you're trying to make allowances for future sea level rise, and you're very risk averse, right, you're going to build to try to be, let's say, at like the 1% or even higher level of, you know, potential inundation. That is to say, you want to avoid inundation in the future as much as possible. Let's say if you're building a nuclear power plant or, you know, some other piece of critical infrastructure on the coast. And so this long tail that intrinsically comes into our projections, it's always gonna come into our projections because of the nature of ice sheet dynamics makes adaptation costs rise very, very quickly, right? And so this is an intrinsic problem. I'm not talking about solving it. What I'm talking, what I'm talking about today is how do we quantify this better? Um, so the, the particular issue that, that we're tackling in my group is how to quantify the uncertainty due to the inherent noisiness of climate, right? And currently this is something that's not done in ice sheet model projections that contribute to sea level projections, right? So if you look at the ocean around ice sheets, so here's one example from Greenland on the left, or if you look at the atmosphere over ice sheets, so here's another example from the Greenland ice sheet uh, of a uh, 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 ice core record of accumulation, what you see is that the climate is noisy, right? Basically the temperature and the snowfall that the ice sheet is seeing um, in the ocean and in the atmosphere are constantly fluctuating, right? And that's because we live in a, in a complex fluid system um, that is chaotic. Um, and, you know, Klaus Hasselman, he recognized this 50 years ago um, and uh, two years ago received the Nobel Prize in Physics um, uh, along with another climate scientist, particularly for his role in elucidating the importance of this ver internal variability of the climate system. And actually in his original paper about this in the 1970s, he talked about how the slowly responding components of the climate system, such as ice sheets, right, act as integrators of this random input. So he really, he, he identified this problem in the 1970s, particularly for ice sheets. And then we spent 50 years not incorporating this variability in climate into our ice sheet model projections. Um, so what we've done with funding from the Heising Simons Foundation um, at NSF, along with collaborators from Dartmouth and Caltech, um, is to build the first large-scale stochastic ice sheet model. Um, and in particular, what we've done is we've taken an existing ice sheet model that's widely used in the community, um, ISSM, um, and we have um, basically architected, re-architected part of the core of the model um, to be able to internally generate noise um, and then apply it to any field in the model. Right. And then we've had uh, various uh, project members working on incorporating and developing realistic stochastic parameterizations for the surface mass balance, that is the snow accumulation and surface melt uh, on the top of the ice sheet, um, ocean melt, iceberg calving, um, some glacial hydrology. And here are some of the many cast of collaborators, particularly I want to point out uh, Vincent Vergence, who's the lead model developer for this project, a postdoc in my group. Uh, Liz Ulti, who's now a professor um, at Middlebury, but who uh, has worked on the SMB component of the model, um, and Amina Ambaloran, who's a PhD student of mine who's working on stochastic cabin. So we have a number of papers about this. The sort of core model code um, was described in a GMD paper last year, and now we've had a few other papers um, recently released and that are, are kind of coming out now. I'm just going to highlight a few of the things that we've done in this problem. So this is Liz Ulti's work. Um, so uh, we have actually quite good regional validated climate models um, that are used to do high resolution projections over ice sheets. Um, the problem is you can't easily run those a hundred or a thousand times in order to produce different realizations of variability. Um, so what Liz has done is using some sparse penalized methods to basically capture the spatial variability and temporal variability of snowfall and surface melt on the surface of the Greenland ice sheet has developed a stochastic model um, for surface mass balance variability. Um, and this is a paper, there's a preprinted GMD that you can currently find uh, online. Um, uh, quickly, another uh, paper that just came out from, from Vincent Verjans um, does the same thing except for ocean forcing. Now in the case of ocean forcing, we do not have high resolution regional models of, of ocean variability around the Greenland ice sheet. So we've had to be a little bit more clever um, in basically taking course models 
and downscaling them or extrapolating them from their sort of course on the on the continental shelf uh, where where their last grid point is right up to the front of the ice sheet, which is where the ice sheet actually sees the ocean. Um, and so we've developed this, uh, Vincent developed this extrapolation technique and also a bias correction technique that takes all available observations around Greenland and uses it to bias correct. So an example here is the red is what a sort of CMIP class ocean model would say for ocean forcing near a glacier in Greenland. The black dots are what observations say. And then our method um, produces the blue and the, the yellow lines here for varying realizations of ocean forcing of the Greenland ice sheet or of this particular glacier in this example. And then finally, here's an, an example of sort of when you actually turn the model on um, this stochastic ice sheet model and start running it, um, an example of an ensemble from a kind of uh, relatively idealized simulation. So this is 500 years of model runs. We have uh, 100 ensemble members here. Those are the blue lines. And then we're basically on the y-axis. We're looking at the change in ice mass. So this is with no trend in climate forcing. And one of the very interesting things that we found that as soon as you turn on this model, it starts drifting, right? And that's not something that if you had the sort of deterministic version of this model with no stochastic forcing, it would not do that drift, right? The black dashed line is the deterministic run here, right? So uh, this is a, uh, a phenomenon that is uh, you know, well known in the stochastic modeling community known as, a, known as noise induced drift. You can come from a variety of different uh, processes, but basically we've identified and we're currently writing a paper um, about how the fact that there are these instabilities that I talked about before inherent in ice sheet dynamics produces the possibility of noise induced bifurcations, also known as noise induced tipping. Um, also, there's nonlinearities within the system that filter symmetric noise and make it asymmetric and cause this drift. Um, and basically, what this means is that if you are running a deterministic ice sheet model, it is going to be intrinsically biased because it does not include this noise induced drift, which occurs in reality. Um, so, um, you know, this is one of the nice things about when you build these new modeling systems, all of a sudden you learn about some of the things that, that kind of you've been doing wrong for a while. Okay, so some takeaway messages um, uh, from, from this part, and then I'm going to do a very brief allusion to just another modeling system that hydrologists might be interested, interested in. Um, sea level rise after 2100 becomes increasingly uncertain and skewed, and this is something that we expect as a fundamental mathematical property of ice sheet instabilities or in any system, in any modeled system that has an instability. Um, ice sheets, they're slow integrators of flat, fast climate and glaciological variability, and this makes them ideal for stochastic approaches as Hasselman um, uh, originally identified and, and as which we've been implementing now in a model over the last few years. Um, so um, these stochastic models are ultimately useful because not only can they tell us how much sea level rise we can expect in the future, that is the uncertainty in our future projections, right? But it actually allows us to tackle a different problem, which is unsolved in the ice sheet modeling community, which is the attribution problem. If you currently look in the IPCC report, there are low to medium confidence statements that humans have caused the change that we've observed or the ice loss that we've observed in the Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheets over the last few decades. Um, and this is like a major issue because there's starting to be litigation over um, the sort of who is responsible for sea level rise and ice sheets are a major contributor to sea level rise. So models like this um, will finally allow us to tackle this question robustly. Uh, and then finally, I just wanna plug this other project. If I was talking in six months, I probably would have talked about this because hydrologists love this stuff. Um, but this is a NASA funded project um, that is, is led by a, a former postdoc of mine, uh, Sammy Buzzard, who's now a lecturer at Cardiff um, and a PhD student, um, Danny Brow. Um, this is um, called Monarchs. It is a tortured acronym, um, uh, but it is basically, it is a 3D hydrology model. It's portable, it's Python native, it's parallelized for water flow on the surface of ice sheets, right? So for those of you who haven't worked on this problem before, right? You have a liquid that is dissolving into the material that it is made, the solid form, the material that it is made out of. So it's a, actually a very interesting um, problem in sort of percolation physics and hydrology um, and boundary, you know, uh, uh, layer issues. Um, and so here's just an example of, of sort of an early uh, result from that. So thank you very much. Happy to take questions or talk over lunch. Thank you, Alex. Are there any questions? We have time for one question. We see a question over there. Sorry, Mike. Right? Raise your hand. 
So you were showing that the uh, stochastic models were giving um, results that were sort of worse than the deterministic models where the sea level rise was higher. Uh, and you also said that we don't have enough data to really test what's happening over a long kind of decadal time scale. So how do you know if your worst predictions are right? <laughs> yes. So when you say worse, I think you're saying that not in terms of accuracy, but in terms of like the producing first, more sea level rise. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Skewed towards, I call it worst case scenarios. Yes. So um, how do we know? Um, that's a tricky problem. And it's actually the subject of another project that we're just spinning up. Um, this is part of a career grant um, that was just funded for my group. Um, the issue is data simulation um, there. And uh, right now, the way that most ice sheet models incorporate information about the past is that um, they are uh, what they, they undergo what's called snapshot initialization, which is basically they are initialized at one point in time with observations, right? And that is usually in the last 30 years because that's when we have the best observations. Um, and the issue there is that because ice sheets change on such long time scales, um, that if there is a transient in ice sheet change, like for example, when you initialize your ice sheet model, let's say in the year 2000 or 2010, which is when we initialize most of our future projections, if there was a sort of transient tendency in the ice sheet, which there was for the Greenland and in the Antarctic ice sheets over the last 30 years, um, then you're basically assuming that the model starts at a steady state, typically assuming that the model starts at a steady state. Um, and so what you need is you need transient data assimilation methods in order to capture that sort of uh, tendency um, in, in the real system um, by assimilating observations at many different points in time, um, even before the satellite era. Um, and so that is something that the community is currently grappling with, um, but it's something that our models don't all universally um, deal with right now. Um, so the answer is it's sort of a work in progress. <laughs>